All right. Hey, it's one o'clock, everybody. It is time for today's Black Hills Information Security webcast. Thank you for joining us for pre-show banter. If you're just joining us right now, that's fine. Uh, You can join us in the future uh, for pre-show banter if you want to. It's about 30 minutes ahead of time. Uh, We cut that part out of the recordings because who needs that? (laughs) Uh, but we got Ralph and Travis here today. They're going to talk about physical, right? Practical physical exploitation. We wanted to put some more words in there, but we ran out of space. <laughs> uh, so, to everyone that joined us for pre-show banter, thank you so much. Go ahead and kill your cameras and microphones. We'll come back for Q and A. Ian, help me with Q and A at the end. That would be great. Uh, yeah. And Ralph and Travis, it is all yours. If you need anything, we'll be here. All right, coming up prayer. All right, awesome. Uh, First, thank you everyone for joining our webcast. We are going to be diving into physical um, uh, pen tests, right? And we're going to talk kind of a high level through the whole process, um, get into some uh, stuff. Um, This has kind of been a long time coming. Um, Me and Travis have uh, personally done um, a physical pen test together. And so we're going to kind of tag team uh, the slides here and I hope you guys uh, get some value out of this. So who am I? Ralph May. I um, have some stuff on there. I also teach a class um, called Hacker Ops, where I do some uh, DevOps for hackers. And I've also done a lot of physical pen tests. Um, so that's really what we're going to be focusing on today. And we're going to focus on kind of the whole process, right? How to actually, you know, go through and, you know, do this pen test from a practical standpoint based off of us doing this a bunch of times, right? Um, we're not going to talk about a lot of um, magical ways to do pen tests or excuse me, physical pen tests. I say magical because there's like, you know, very odd cases that, you know, it worked one time, but it's probably not going to work all the time. So we're really going to focus on the most um, likely attack pass and just kind of how to plan that out. Right. Um, and also Travis Weathers, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Travis? Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. I'm happy to be here with the Black Hills folks. Uh, Travis Weathers uh, with uh, Optive Security currently. Um, jumped into to penetration testing when I stepped away from the military back in 2014. I've had a great time doing it. Physical security has absolutely been my my passion from the get go. Uh, recently spoke at DEF CON uh, for a tool that I just released, uh, Doppelganger RFID. Uh, you can throw it in your your long range readers, um, catch some catch some bad badges from uh, from a distance. So yeah, uh, happy to to walk through some of these uh, these scenarios. Um, really the, the driver behind this is we've seen a lot of, uh, people do physical assessments and things go awry. So, so big touching points is doing it safely, doing it legally, um, not ending up on the news, not ending up in handcuffs, um, not placing your clients in, in a a lesser state of security than, than before you got there to do your, your assessment. So, um, thanks for joining. Thanks for having me, uh, Black Hills. All right. Awesome. Um, so with all that in mind, this is kind of be our agenda, a uh, real high level here. So um, we are going to talk about rules of engagement. This is where we're going to start this physical pen test in the first place, right? Where we're going to talk to the client. We're going to talk about remote recon, you know, establishing what, where the building is, uh, geospatial, stuff like that. And then we're going to talk about on-site surveillance. When you actually get there, what we're going to try to do, what we're looking for, um, and, you know, and then we're going to take that and uh, move into threat profiling. You know, what we're going to, tr- with the information we've gathered so far, what's the best avenue of attack, right? And then um, we're going to talk about the unauthorized access when we actually are going into the building, right? So we've got a plan together. We're going to, you know, actually go in and try to, um, you know, breach uh, the building. Then we're going to talk about post exploitation. So once you get inside, what's the point, right? Just going inside of a building. Sure, you could say that, but can you show impact, right? If some attacker were to get inside of a building, what could they do? And how would that affect the organization? And last, um, but most importantly, we're going to talk about reporting and kind of how to do that on a physical assessment. It's a very fluid and dynamic situation. And there are some considerations for how to actually grab the evidence so that you're just not writing particularly um, paragraphs of what you did. You can hopefully support some of that and provide some value to the client so they can see these things. All right. Um, I guess we'll start off with rules engagement. And uh, Travis, if you have anything, jump right in. Um, So right off the top, we have the goals and objectives and kind of the do's and don'ts. Um, So first, we want to obviously host a call with the client and figure out what they want to get from this assessment, right? What are their fears? What are the most important things to them, right? Um, You know, what keeps them up at night, right? And we also want to um, 
ask who's involved in the planning, right? So a lot of times when you're on these phone calls, they're, you know, they don't want to tell everybody. So we want to know who is involved in this. And so that we don't end up in a scenario where you find a bolo in a jar that happens to have your photo in it, um, which has actually happened before. <laughs> and then um, obviously some of the don'ts, um, you know, assume that you're going to get DA right away. Um, and, <laughs> Um, you know, you're going to have this, uh, you know, full process that might not be their goal, right? They might just want to know, can you get in the building and not where you're going to go with that uh, next, right? Um, you know, forgetting to inform the client stakeholders and, um, you know, that things need to remain confidential, right? You don't want that bolo in the drawer, um, even though sometimes the client will go around your back. So, I mean, whatever it is, it's their assessment, their money. And then, you um, also, uh, you know, forgetting to capture information about, you know, who owns the facility, whether they have security guards, whether those security guards have weapons, right? We want to know all of that. And we also want to know what their response plan is going to be, um, you know, during this incident, if it were to arise, right? Yeah. So, so one thing I'd, I'd add to that is a lot of times you can get on a call with a client and they can say, oh, yeah, we, we, we own this building. In reality, they own maybe floors 12 through 14 of this sky rise building and here they are trying to give you authorization to uh clone mm -hmm. a badge in the lobby well yeah. that letter of authorization isn't going to mean much when you get arrested downstairs it's gonna it's gonna matter when you're when you're up on those those upper level floors so really knowing who owns that that building and getting authorization from everyone involved um, to do that testing is, is key is key um, speaking of authorized actions, right? Um, so we have, uh, you know, kind of a, a graph here to, to depict, right? You know, we're really going to focus on the engagement type, right? So, and that's going to kind of drive what we're going to look for in our authorized actions or in our um, uh, letter of authorization, right? So kind of a letter that we're going to get them to sign to agree to, right? Um, so something like in a, uh, you know, a facility breach where you're trying to get inside, kind of do everything, um, you know, your intent and goal in this particular example, obviously, is possibly gain access to a power distribution plan at a company. And then your authorized actions might be, you know, badge replication, badge cloning, surreptitious sur entry, other things like that, right? And where do they want it to go? Um, and honestly, this is a conversation with the client. Um, and we want to find out, you know, where is too far? A lot of times in these like more industrial control systems, we won't go too far. And I'll be very specific and clear that I'm not going to do this because, you know, I don't want anything to go down or anything to get messed up just because we wanted to see if we could, right? Um, but I will maybe get right to that box, take a picture and walk away. Um, or maybe the um, engagement is just social engineering. Can you just get into the building, right? Can you just social engineer the scenario, um, impersonating, maybe just badge replication? Maybe I've seen also engagements, it's just tailgating, okay? We just are proving can you tailgate in our building, which is kind of silly. I could probably ask a couple of questions, but you know what? Let's find out. They put in a new anti-tailgating uh, control. Can you do it? Um, and so, um, yeah, both of those. Anything else, Travis? Yeah, one thing I would, I would add there, anytime you're doing social engineering, we've seen this go wrong in the past, um, who you impersonate matters. So uh, obviously impersonating client employees, that's okay. Third-party vendors oftentimes is okay. Uh, you really cross the line when people are like, oh yeah, I'll just pretend to be the FBI and walk into this place, or I'm going to pretend to be the fire department. And, yeah, and yeah. Stay away from federal agencies. Expect, uh, uh, yeah. fire extinguishers. Uh, that every single time, impersonation of local federal government employees or agencies uh, it always land you in jail, regardless of what your uh, your letter of authorization says, or what, regardless of what your your client um, requests of you. Uh, we've had engagements where clients are like, "Oh, hey, can you uh, mail a package into our mail room that emulates uh, a, a pipe bomb?" Um, the answer is no every time, <laughs> every single time, <laughs> every single time. Obviously, you you have no control over how that may go or yeah. the facilities that it crosses through. Uh, or the panic that can ensue from that. So um, sure. that, that, that's a real real scenario that has happened in the past. So um, be be wary of, of what you're asked to do on, on physical engagements and give yourself that, the, that kind of attestation of whether or not this is going to end well for the client and yourself, or if it has the, the, the potential to go uh, south really quick. During a physical engagement, the client isn't always right, okay? They, they need some kind of like, hey, this is not going to be safe for us or other people. And, you know, you're going to need to establish those lines, okay? Um, 
obviously another thing to talk about uh is obviously prohibited actions in different areas that you might want to stay um you know out of scope or off limits okay and depending on the engagement type you're going to have different ones in here we have a you know obviously um uh, removal of employees, right, or taking documents. Usually, that's usually off limits. Um, uh, another one that I've seen often, which is in here, is accessing the CEO's room or any other kind of like high level executive, other things like that. They just feel like it's it, it's too high touch. And um, honestly, the truth be told, from a threat model perspective, they usually don't really have access to anything anyway. So it's just kind of silly. It's you know like showing off, um, and it doesn't provide value to the customer. Um, and there, you know. There may be certain areas of the facility that they just don't want you to even try to access um, because um, possibly those areas are unsafe for you to try to access or they're just something that they don't want to uh, test because of, um, you know, whatever internal politics. All right. Another thing with your uh, letter of authorization is kind of response planning. What are you going to do? Uh, you know, how, how, what's the escalation in the process once maybe you do get caught, right? Um, so uh, who's authorized to do this test? All the names should be there, okay? Um, no, you know, second person just got added to the team. They're not on the authorization letter. This is going to get weird. Um, you know, who's the primary and alternate contact? These should always be an alternate, not just one person. For whatever reason, most likely it's going to be at night and other things like that. Have an alternate. Make sure that's something that you push for. Um, you know, what authorizations are at, are are um, authorized actions that can be performed, you know, the out of, uh, out of scope or off limits areas. When can the testing happen, right? Sometimes, you know, they have time restrictions, right? I haven't seen too many of that, but sometimes that's the case as well. Um, where is this going to be taking place? I want to know exact building locations. So I don't, you know, uh, it, it's that multi-tenants. And then obviously the signature on the bottom, who authorized this, um, you know, having that there is is going to be crucially important when you try to escalate if something does happen, right? Yeah. So, so something to note on that that signature there again, the person that that hired you from the client location to perform that that testing isn't always the right person to be signing that that document. Um, maybe it, it's worth having their their inside counsel look at the document to say, yeah, this is this is something we buy off on as an organization versus this is something the CTO wanted uh, as part of this as part of this assessment. Um, with this response planning, that's something I always tell my guys is uh, uh, rule number one in physical testing is don't get caught. Don't get caught. That's the easiest thing. Uh, rule number two is always carry that authorization letter in your front pocket. So that way, if there is an escalation and there are armed guards uh, no drawing back. on you, the last thing you <laughs> want to do is reach and reach behind your back to pull out your authorization letter. Have that that front center uh, easily accessible where, where you can deconflict any potential um, catastrophic uh, issue. Awesome. All right. Um, let's talk about remote recon. You want to go ahead and dive through this one, Travis? Just let me know. Yeah. Where yeah. Yeah. Go ahead and uh, slide it over. Uh, so remote recon, why do we do remote recon? Well, first, first thing, and first and foremost is any amount of time you spend on that client, uh, uh target building is, is time that you could be detected in the engagement to, can go south. When your client is spending multiple thousands of dollars to bring you out to do a physical assessment, Last thing you want to do is start your reconnaissance on day one by walking up to the front entrance uh, and blowing it. So everything we do is the least amount of time on site, the better. Um, this this applies even for any type of real world attack, right? You're not going to go and do in-depth reconnaissance uh, walking around the building. You're going to learn as much about the, uh, as much about the building as possible before you go to to do that entry uh, if you want to avoid detection. And arrest, right? So, uh, first thing we want to do is, from a remote perspective, is uh, our geospatial reconnaissance. So, we want to look at aerial maps. Uh, we want to determine the layout of the facility. You can pull so much information from ArcGIS, being uh, Google Maps, Google Earth, that you you likely don't have to do any drive-bys once you get on site. So, you can de determine the layout of the facility. Uh, a lot of times, you can see where the the cameras are, where they're placed, where they're directed. Uh, you can identify nearby establishments that uh, employees frequent. Uh, you can look at traffic patterns in and out of the area. So that way, when you do get on site, you know where to stage your vehicle to do your, your long range reconnaissance before you even walk out uh, to do uh, your, your in-depth um, uh, analysis. Um, street view mapping. You can pull so much, so much information. We touched on the camera placement and viewing angles. You can also look at choke points. 
maybe part of your assessment is, hey, the client really wants us to clone someone's badge. If you can identify that choke point before you even show up on site, yeah. you could be in and out on a badge clone in a matter of minutes. Um, yeah, go ahead and uh, uh, skip to the next one. Um, here's an uh, example uh, facility where just Google Earth, you can pan, pan around in the street view to see where the cameras are. Uh, you have a lot of analysis. So maybe I don't want to drive around this corner to, to, to show up. Maybe I'll come around the other side of the facility and, and do my my uh, my long range surveillance. Uh, go ahead. Choke points, uh, identifying this ahead, mapping it out. Uh, not only does this give you uh, reference material for your, your your reporting phase, but you're prepared before you even get on site. Go ahead. Um, social media is my so, favorite one. <laughs> yeah. So you'll be surprised at what you can find on social media. Uh, if you can have a badge already printed off before you get there, you just saved yourself two to three hours that you might be stressing out trying to clone badges or, or trying to get in. Um, so go on Instagram, look at the, uh, search the company's name, search the company's address, the facility address, look for, uh, hashtags and follow the rabbit holes. If you see uh, maybe they don't have any badge photos on their their, their corporate site. Um, maybe you see some employees that have posted there. Go through the employees' Instagrams if they're public. Um, chances are you'll find one, two, three, seven hundred uh, different posts from their employees starting their first day or showing their their badge on their last day. That gives you a lot of opportunity to make a realistic badge before you even get there, which adds uh, validity to to your 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 your, your time on site. Um, LinkedIn. Um, do a little bit of research. You don't have to go all the way down the rabbit hole here. No, no one's saying like, hey, spend two, three weeks collecting every bit of information you can. Um, just capture some names, the department structure, contact information, technologies they use. Maybe they own some subsidiaries or other locations that you can leverage if you have to result to social engineering. You know how to talk their lingo, how to reference their organizations. Everyone calls their uh, their security department a different thing. So maybe maybe understand how they, how they reference that. Um, go ahead. Here's just some some quick examples. Uh, yesterday, I went on and and just searched badge ID uh, and came up with literally thousands of, of, of badges that you can you can leverage. Um, go ahead. Uh, some other things that you want to look up from a remote standpoint before you get on site. Um, look up the the environmental conditions. Uh, if you're going to do an engagement for a power distribution company, look at OSHA uh, Part 1910. There's some requirements that you have to have to go into those areas. And if you show up on site unprepared, maybe you got to call your client and be like, oh, hey, we're going to have to do this another time because Amazon says my my hard hat and boots aren't going to get here for another three days. Um, so look yeah, up what it is you're doing, uh, research it and have it ready to go. Yeah, have that conversation with the client too, right? So is there areas in this facility that have safety requirements or other things that we need to be considerate of when we're doing this engagement? Um, yes, doing the research uh, online, but I'd rather just also know as well, right? Um, and be prepared for those because, you know, um, just because you say you could do this physical assessment doesn't mean that you're necessarily ready. So, you know, be ready doing and all of this is getting ready before you get there. Because as me and Travis both know, time is of the essence. It goes so fast and you just don't have that much time on target um, when you get there. So try not to be doing all this stuff the day of. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, On-site surveillance. Okay. So we've, uh, you know, kind of done our research and we arrive on site, right? This is where we're going to kind of collaborate or corroborate, excuse me, the information we got from remote reconnaissance with actually what's there stuff changes okay even the even the freshest data and that's where the on-site is a lot of it is just to confirm what we hopefully already know about the environment right um so some considerations once you are on site right um once you're compromised the engage is over the engagement's over okay um there is really not a whole lot of value in continuing to continue the engagement okay um really Perform the actions you just need to to do the uh, engagement. Um, we'll talk more about this one, but you know, once you're done, just leave. Don't go on for another thing. Hey, I got access to everything. I'm going to try this one more thing. That's when you get caught, okay? Um, and it kind of devalue what you've done, right? Um, only carry the tools that you require. Do not bring a backpack with like 900 tools just in case. All this stuff. You really just want to bring what you need, okay? Um, keep it as light as possible. 
um, you know, have a way to log your activities when you're on site. So, uh, you know, writing this down in your note, your phone is like the Swiss army knife of this whole engagement. Um, blend into your environment. Uh, don't wear shorts if obviously you're going into just about any uh, environment that is a, a professional environment, right? Figure out what they're wearing, figure out their clothes and dress attire. If you're, I've done uh, very large law firms, I got a suit, right? Um, and so, and people can tell the guard at the front will know whether that's a cheap shoot, suit, excuse me, or an expensive suit before you get there. That's all they see in these, you know, environments, right? So blend in. Um, you know, have a plan to defuse the uh, a confrontation. So why are you there? Like have your scenario for why you're there, what you're doing and who you are, right? Um, another thing about that, use your real name. Um, it's just easier. You don't have to forget to make up a fake persona and all this other fun stuff. You won't forget your real name and no one's pr probably gonna go do a whole full check, okay? Um, a lot of these organizations are very large too, so they don't know everyone who works there, okay? If it's a very small organization, then appropriate, right? Um, carry your authorization in that front pocket, right? As we've talked about for de-escalating that situation, if it does come to that, know that there could be security guards. Also about the uh, security guards and on consideration, they may have a on-site uh, off-duty officer for the whole building, but the company doesn't actually employ that officer. The building does know about that information. That's going to be crucial if an escalation does happen or someone notices you doing something suspicious. Um, and obviously communicate with your primary contact when you're on site, right? Don't, they already know you're going to be doing this. It doesn't have to be a, you know, a full mystery. You can say, hey, I'm going to be coming on site around this time, blah, blah, blah. You know, communication is key so that they'll know to be ready if something does happen, right? All right, so on site, we're looking at security posture. What what is it like, right? What um, are the roaming guards, stationary guards? Uh, I've seen mixes of the both, or just no guards at all, right? Um, what's the shift change? Find that inform find that information out by obviously doing a little reconnaissance, right? Um, you know, are they on guard? Are, if they do have guards, are they on guard twenty four seven? Maybe they have just a, a small window during regular business hours, so on and so forth. Um, looking at camera placements, um, don't let cameras stop you from doing engagements. Cameras are only to collect evidence. They're not actually, in majority of cases, there's not someone, this isn't a casino, unless it is, <laughs> where someone's actively watching it. And weirdly enough, in the casino example, they're actually watching the money, not necessarily you. You have to pretty much do something very kind of uh, grandiose to, to bring the attention where they'll actually bring in security. Um, and then obviously lighting at night and other stuff like that. Ingress, uh, where where do people enter the building and where do they leave the building normally, right? So these are all really things that you want to figure out. And I can't find that out online per se. I can make some guesses, but when I get there, I get to confirm that information so that we can make the decisions. Yeah, one thing I would say is as, as you're doing this on-site reconnaissance, be as far away from it as possible. Um, if you can have a telephoto lens uh, off in the distance and you could be taking pictures of these things and analyzing them later, or maybe you you put a, a cell phone up in your window or maybe have a, some type of camera in your car, just do a circle around the building, go back and analyze that offsite. Um, yeah. Again, exposing yourself uh, is probably the, the biggest factor to detection and uh, uh, ruining the engagement. So everything you can do from a distance or away from uh, the actual target facility, um, you, you're gonna be better off in the end. Yeah, we, we don't typically uh, recommend or usually have the way to, you know, change our looks and appearances and all this other fun stuff. And it, you know, increases the difficulty and the time on target. So as Travis is saying, we want to expose ourselves the least possible only when we're like, we're about to enter, right? Like we're, not, we're, we're moving through. Yeah. Not to mention that it drives up the cost of the engagement if you start Absolutely. putting people on site. So a lot of the times if it's no armed guard on site, guess what? It's you by yourself. Uh, and if you're burned, it's over. Um, yep. So yep. that's always something to consider. All right. So um, the next thing is kind of our access control types. Uh, how, how are people getting in and, in and out of the building? Um, people typically do not have a key, right, to enter these buildings or facilities. Um, typically, we're looking at hundreds to thousands of employees across multiple buildings. Um, they're not going to just give out a key uh, to unlock these doors to get in. So typically, they'll have some kind of badging technology, head procs, I-class, and DALA. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff out there. Um, but uh, HID, uh, as a manufacturer, is the dominant force in these kind of commercial um, uh, digital access control systems, right? Um, you know, if you do find these readers and there's different types out there, 
Um, for example, if it's an iClass SE, do they possibly have legacy enabled um, multi-class readers in place? I mean, I can look at readers now and tell you whether it's a multi-class, an iClass SE just from afar, right? But um, you'll need to figure out and confirm that. And you can take some of the stuff when you get on site, maybe from before, hopefully, if you get possibly pictures of the badge reader before you even get there, you might even be even closer to that, right? Um, so confirming all this stuff really helps because that moves into the next phase where we're actually trying to clone that badge, right? We need to have the right equipment with us and know what our plan is right um and then obviously looking for easy bypasses okay so doors that have rec sensors um unprotected crash bars uh exterior doors that just aren't closing all the way seen that before lots of other good ways to get in um weak mechanical locks uh typically i uh, advise against doing any kind of lock picking a lot of these facilities have pretty decent locks medicos and other things like that uh, i'm not a lock picking lawyer i don't have an aspiration necessarily to break some of these very complex devices and it, additionally it Honestly, it's kind of weird to be there picking a lock, right? Yeah. Um, so it doesn't really blend in. Yeah, to piggyback on that, if you uh, pick your way into a building, uh, you're going to have to pick it closed. So <laughs> yeah. to, uh, that goes back to uh, never leaving yeah. the, the, the facility uh, in a less secure state. So uh, I, what, what I always preach is uh, if you're lock picking your way into the building, you probably didn't do good enough reconnaissance in the first place. Yeah, um, by all means, bring some lock picks with you. They're great for interior doors. Um, they're great for opening up a shred bin to show impact once you're inside the facility, um, using them to get into the facility. Again, unless you're the lock picking lawyer uh, or, or someone of that caliber, um, chances are uh, you're going to you're going to spend a lot of time. You're going to expose yourself on a camera. And then if a security guard comes around the, the, the corner and you've got your lock picks out and plug spinner, uh, things are going to go real south real quick. Yeah, it's a lot of extra gear as well. So. Yeah. All right. Um, Let's talk about uh, employee ana analysis, right? So uh, another thing to look at is badge exposure policy. This is a big one. Uh, I mean, do people have the badge as out or not, right? I've seen it both ways. I've seen where they have zero badge exposure policy, meaning they haven't told their employees what to do with their badge. So it's always dangling out, moving around. I've seen other facilities where they have very decent badge exposure policies. When they walk outside the facility, they're covering that badge. Um, it becomes a little bit harder for us to um, make that badge clones because we have to identify target um, and we're looking for the type of badge because I'm, you know, and a lot of times maybe in a multi facility, um, there are different badges out there. So it's like, you know, kind of a sea of badges, which is the one that I want, right? Um, so uh, keep an eye on that. Uh, how's the lanyard worn? Do they typically have it on the hip? Do they wear it around the neck? Other things like that. Uh, you know, is it typically inside of a sleeve of some sort? Maybe not. Um, and you should have all that stuff ready to kind of emulate what the employees look like. Um, operating hours, right? So, uh, when's lunch when do people typically get there um you know when is the close of business when are people typically leaving right these are all things that you're gonna the only way to really capture this is to be on site um and and you know we can make some guesstimations around when lunchtime is right and so we could go there and see and then also correlating with some of that other intel we had before where are the best lunch spots that are close by right that's probably where employees are going to frequent right um when is the after hours cleaning crew they'll typically show up uh to clean stuff like that they're pretty easy to identify um, what's the general business attire, right? It's typically never going to be short. So just a heads up, learn that. But the big thing is that just what are they wearing, right? So don't overdress or underdress, okay? You don't want to be wearing a suit when no one wears suits. Um, and you know, obviously don't want to be wearing, um, you know, swim attire when obviously no one's wearing swim attire, right? So th think about it like that. Uh, what's their cell phone? Um, uh, where are they at? Uh, you know, where, where, um, uh, do they, do they have them out? Um, and th this is a big one. Do employees tailgate each other? Like, how are they entering the facility? Are they nicely leaving the door open for others? Do they have any anti-tailgating controls in place? You'll know if they have some kind of tailgate system in place kind of quickly, but sometimes it's not very obvious. Sometimes a little further back th through the process, right? So i um, trying to confirm that information. So yeah, I'd say uh, look at look at all the entrances too. Um, not every door is going to have uh, anti-piggybacking controls um, in a building that has them installed. So um yeah. That. <laughs> I, I see one question. I'll, I'll just throw it out there. So how many months of recon to find their routine? Uh, <laughs> so we're not doing pattern of life establishment. All right. So what we're doing is just looking for the simplest routine, you know, where people are around the basin and, and building. It doesn't take very long. You can easily do this within a day to establish what the process is around the facility. So. Absolutely. All right. So um, we have gathered 
this information uh, before we got there. Now we've confirmed some of that information, maybe gathered more in, in information that we didn't have before we got there because we don't have a way of gathering it remotely. Um, or we've just been able to establish, absolutely, this is the badge reader, let's do. So this is where we get into thro uh, threat profiling. You wanna go yeah. ahead and hit this one, Travis? Yeah, yeah, so, so all we're doing here is we're taking all that information we gathered and we're prioritizing it into a likely scenario of attacks that'll get us in the building and out of the building as fast as possible with the least amount of resistance. So we're just gathering all that information, spitballing it with one another, um, and, and kind of laying out a plan before we, we do those, those actions on site or off site uh, to gain a, a badge clone. Uh, go ahead. Sorry, there you go. Yeah, so we got some, uh, some examples. So say we're on site and we've determined that badge cloning is the, the, um, the attack scenario least likely to get us caught and most likely to, to result in success. Well, what were some of our ob observations that, that made that, that come to light? Maybe it's the fact that employees are wearing their badges when they go across the street to the Starbucks. Um, maybe we determine that hid proxy readers are on the doors and it's easily clonable technology. Um, and that, then we gauge what the, what is the effort that correlates with, with that attack scenario? We only got three days on site. That first day is, is spent doing your recon. That second day is really there for that attack scenario. And that third, that third day that you're on site is kind of like the makeup day if something goes wrong or maybe you need to go back in, maybe goals change. So what's the effort to get inside that building? Um, uh, Off-site staging, uh, maybe you can do uh, set up at that, that Starbucks early in the morning, get a badge read, step away from the building, write it to a reader, uh, and then um, 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 go back to the site. Well, what's the risk that kind of correlates with doing those those uh, those actions. Well, there's there's the risk of discovery. Uh, if you get too close with your, your badge reader, um, that's been done. You can get some some pretty creepy situations. Oh, um, it gets real way. creepy real fast. <laughs> you need to have your plan. If you're if you're carrying a parking garage reader in your backpack, um, you'll test that out in your office and you'll be like, oh, yeah, I'm getting about 20 inches. I can read a badge. <laughs> Introduce metal, your backpack, other cards that are in and around the area. You're going to start getting some wonky reads, so you have to get um, uncomfortably co close sometimes to, to get those reads. So there's always that possibility of uh, being discovered. Um, there's a chance of RF interference, um, and there's also uh, a chance that you capture someone else's badge. Um, that's happened in the past. Uh, doesn't mean you need to write it and go access their facility. Uh, it just means that <laughs> Free pen test. you captured someone else's badges. You thought that was the uh, the victim you were after. You wrote it to the 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 the, the, the blank card you have, and now you go to, go to badge in, and you're thinking, oh man, maybe the technology was off, or maybe something's not right here, and you have to go back and uh, do another another badge read. Um, I'll, I'll skip over the social engineering one. Um, you can you can kind of see uh, that for yourself. Uh, but what about surreptitious surreptitious entry? Um, maybe. Everything is 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 locked up tight. Um, they've got uh, grappling hook, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. when, you, when you did your your initial analysis, you saw that man. They've got biometric readers. They've got um, guards sitting at the door. Um, but on the back side of the building, there's a balcony with a door that doesn't have a latch. So maybe we can we can use a, a ladder um, after hours, or maybe throw a grappling hook up there uh, and climb up uh, to that second story and go in that way. Well, what are the risks associated with that? Obviously, yeah, running so guards, uh, possibil possibility of uh, uh, getting caught by a wide angle uh, security camera. If you're doing it at night, chances are uh, a security guard sitting at his desk and sees something scurry across the screen. It might draw some attention. And then again, you've got that that, that exposure to overhead lighting. So if people so, are driving by in the middle of the night and they see some guy throwing a, a grappling hook up on a building. Um Maybe they might call that in themselves. And instead of meeting with the security team, you're meeting with a, a, a law enforcement officer. So please note, Spider-Man should be last resort, okay? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so, and even when you think about that, right? Um, think about like, is it even possible, right? Is this a good idea? Am I capable of doing this, right? Like, I mean, just because you can, maybe you shouldn't, okay? So, I mean, going down that, we're looking for that badge clone, social engineering next, and that surreptitious entry, if it really makes sense, then, I mean, we have had examples of this happening, but it ends up being the low-hanging fruit or more in like, not the low-hanging fruit, but like the high-hanging fruit, right? They're really, the kind of the level that you're you're uh, least likely to do and, um, you know, might want to consult sometimes with the client if that's something they want to take on. So absolutely. All right. Next slide. Yep. 
All right, so here we are. We, we validated our, our possible scenarios and we determined, hey, going for this, uh, th this bad read is going to be the way to go. Well, now you got to reverse plan how you're going to get this, uh, this done. So we talk, we're going to beat this one into the ground is never deviate from the plan. Whenever you have a plan, never deviate from it. It's when you step away from the plan that things go south, you get detected, you make a mistake, uh, someone gets upset. So make that plan, have a plan for everything you need. So we talked about only carrying the tools that you need. So go and badge cloning. You're going to need your, your hid prox reader. Um, you're going to need a prox mark or a uh, iCopy XS. So that way you can write that, 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 that uh, bad, badge that you uh, stole from, from an employee to a blank card. You're going to have to make a replica ID card. Uh, chances are you probably did this. If you did good remote reconnaissance, you probably already have one of those ready to go. Um, and then if dictated by the engagement, maybe you need to have some type of uh, means to unlock a computer, uh, plan a device, um, whatever tool it is to do your post-exploitation, and then your, your authorization letter, of course. Uh, so uh, reference your timeline. Make that, that, that confirmed timeline. It should be really easy to do after you've done all the, the, uh, the previous analysis. You know when people are going to the coffee shop. So get there at a specific time, um, set a limit for when it is that you want to be able to um, capture this badge. And if it doesn't work, maybe go back and reevaluate. Well, why, why is the badge not capturing? Maybe I brought a hidden I-class SE long range reader when I should have brought a hid prox reader. Uh, and that's why I didn't catch any badges. I was cloning the wrong technology. Um, have a timeline for for when you get back and write that, uh, uh, that, that card um, to a blank card validate that your drop device or whatever post x tool you, you plan to uh, deploy ensure that that works before you get there last thing you want to do is get in the building and end up having to troubleshoot why your drop okay. device is not making egress calls out um and then have a time to actually go in maybe you've gauged hey lunch window is between 12 and one o'clock it's probably best for me to go in when the building is out and maybe some people are returning from lunch um that might benefit the benefit me the most and then also have a time to depart that that facility um, and then again sure up that cover story um, have have what you're going to say or what you're going to do when and if someone approaches you ready to go so that way you're not bumbling over your words yeah the other thing too is i've gone uh done business or excuse me building entries at night no one should be there but there's like a bunch of people working in desk i'm like they need to go home but have a story, right? Be, why are you there, right? So just note that a lot of times they won't bother you because typically there's a pretty large organization. Just, you know, have that, be ready. Even when there shouldn't be people there, okay? All right. So this is where we get to all the planning and all these great ideas that we have put together. And we're, this is when your nerves start, okay? This is where you actually get to get a little sweat, and you know, go through that process, depending on how, no matter how many times you've done it, you're going to feel this, okay? And it's, it reminds me of just jumping out of airplanes. If you're not nervous, you're not safe, okay? You, cause that keeps you thinking about the process and thinking about what you're gonna do so you can hopefully perform, right? All right, so, um, you know, fully understand the intent, uh, you know, having that authorization letter, and what you're supposed to be doing, that will mitigate a lot of your issues, okay? Um, you know, and the legal complications, right? So knowing just, hey, this is my plan, this is what they said I could do, this is what we're gonna do, right? Um, don't get complacent, right? And just because you get into a facility doesn't mean it's over or that you've won or succeeded. You're not done until you leave that building and you are driving away. Everything is on while you're there, okay? So be in that moment and don't get caught up in the success that you're having, right? Um, and then uh, obviously communicate with your um, primary contact before performing actions. They're supposed to be, you. they hired you. They want this to happen, right? So it doesn't have to be a total, they should know, hey, we plan to do an entry tonight. So they're ready if something does happen, right? Yeah. So one thing I'd, I'd, I'd say to the, the, the don't get complacent, oftentimes there's not a whole lot of us in the industry that enjoy doing physical assessments. Uh, there's a lot of people say they want to do physical assessments and they go and do one. And they're mm -hmm. like, ah, oh, no, this is not for me. This is way too uncomfortable. So the folks that do it tend to do a lot of them. You're traveling from site to site. Maybe you'll get a weekend off. 
uh, a two weeks off, go do another type of engagement, but then you're back on site doing these things and you'll, you'll be like, okay, this one is a, a facility breach. Uh, I know how I'm going to do a facility breach, wham, bam, do it. And you get complacent and you just look at, here's the engagement type, I'm going for it. And you forget to reread that authorization letter, or you forget to look over those kickoff call notes to remember, oh yeah, there's this one nuance where they don't want me to do X, Y, and Z, or they don't want me to go here. And next thing you know, you're in the building doing exactly what they told you not to do because you forgot to read the engagement letter um, right before going into that, that facility that day. Um, so don't get complacent. Um, always, always keep up with your documentation. Awesome. All right. Um, considerations. This is definitely something to consider. Um, and you'll kind of have this is, you know, how, how big is this? Like how many employees are there? Right. I've done very small facilities where they have like eight employees. So um, when that typically happens, it's immediately into some kind of uh, social engineering scenario. Right. Um, if especially if you don't have some way to badge in. If it's a much bigger organization, they're not going to know who you are. You are whoever you want to be. You're I'm typically would go with IT because obviously uh, I've had people literally ask me to go fix their computer on a physical engagement, right? And me go over there and actually compromise that computer as part of me fixing it. I actually did fix the computer and then I moved on, right? So having that scenario that makes sense that like, you know, you're not here to fix the plumbing and you have no plumbing gear on, right? So uh, no plumbing, you don't look like a plumber, excuse me. Um, so yeah, it, knowing the size of the facility is going to be very important, and it will also help you um, know you know where to do you know where to stay and stuff like that. So yeah, those, those, those facility sizes will get you. Um, yeah. Big facility, way easier to break into than a yes. small facility where everyone knows everyone, and if someone sees something off, they're talking to everybody on their their group chat. Yeah. All right. So uh, Travis brought this one up, um, and this is during the execution. Uh, never leave the facility less secure than you got there, right? So if you know, don't pick a lock and leave it un or leave it uh, unlocked, um, and you know, don't do anything that would make the facility less secure, right? Because what's going to end up happening is you're going to write about that, and they're like, "Why did you leave this door open?" Or you know, and maybe something bad could have happened later, right? Um, so you don't want to have to defend yourself for that action, okay? Um, you know, don't deviate from the plan, stick to that because I also, um, have had scenarios, not me personally, but other, many other consultants where they do deviate from the plan. They go to do one last thing and that's how they got caught or that's how it got escalated in a way that they were very much unintended. Okay. Um, so it goes from a, a super success high. We're going to do one more thing. We're really going to show impact to a much low or low when you are caught, and everything that you had done and all that work just kind of went down the drain, right? Um, have a way, or obviously having your authorization letter, uh, we'll keep harping on that one. Um, having a method to log your actions in real time, um, you know, your iPhone or whatever phone is going to be kind of your Swiss army knife in this situation, mainly because everyone has phones with them. It's not weird to have a phone. Um, there are certain facilities where you can't bring phones in, but typically not going to be testing those. All right. So you probably don't have to worry about that, but your phone will be a way of logging actions, taking photos and other stuff like that. So have a plan on how you're going to use it, right? Practice how you're going to take pictures. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, don't deviate from the plan. Um, if you are unable to achieve your goal, Within a lot of time, leave, okay? So don't push it further, uh, you know, to stay on target, right? Have your plan in place. Uh-oh, this door is something I can't get through, you know, move out and, and, and go from there. Um, if you uh, are successful, don't go back in. Now, I've had examples where we told the client, hey, you're successful. Hey, could you do this again? If we have time, that's something to consider. But other than that, I would avoid going back in, right? Because again, that's when you get caught. The more presence you have on target, the higher the likelihood that somebody might ask the wrong questions and escalate that situation, right? Um, if your nerves are getting bet the better of you, right? You're, you're, you're anxious, go to the bathroom, okay? Just, re just calm down. Um, you know, and, and, and move on from there. Right. Um, there will always be nerves in there and those are healthy. Those are there hopefully to keep you safe. Right. It makes you think about the situation. Um, and it also helps you prevent from getting complacent. Um, if, uh, no one is walking around talking on their cell phones, don't do it. Okay. Um, it, it kind of stands out. Uh, you know, I, I've had different scenarios where we've tried to play this out. Um, and don't get carried away. So 
Yeah. So there's one one bullet I forgot to put up here. And it's a pretty important one. Um, never for any reason intentionally trigger an alarm within the facility to assess the response plan. Uh, <laughs> it's never never a good idea. Um, if a client asks you to do that, again, go back to be the consultant. Um, let them know like, hey, sending a pipe bomb in the, in the mail isn't a good idea. But also at the yeah. same time, setting off an alarm in a uh, state or local government facility, probably not a good idea. Um, we don't need to assess the, the response plan. Yeah. After the engagement, maybe we can look at your response plan and see what it says you should do. And maybe there's some tips that we can do to tweak that, but but you never want to intentionally trigger uh, alarms uh, within a client facility. All right. So you get in there. Now what? Where are you going? Right. What do you have access to? What can your card possibly do? You might not know where the card can or can't go. Right. Um, you know, is card access required? Um, you know, fire evacuation map, you know, identifying points of egress, you know, what's in the building. A lot of times what I'll do is once I get inside, I'll try to avoid necessarily going in extra doors. I don't need to. Um, and with whatever my plan is, maybe I'm planning to drop this device. So I'm going to go look for a good place to do that. Right. Um, so, and obviously different facilities are going to dictate where you need to go um, and what you're trying to accomplish. Right. Um, it's okay to necessarily leave and come back if the scenario warrants that and you feel like it is an easy approach. So you have a good badge. Uh, there's a lot of people that frequent this facility and, you know, but no, there is risk going back. Um, you know, obviously remember to try to blend in depending on time of day and, the uh, you know, uh, what the facility is like, attire, all the other fun stuff. Um, and, you know, badge placement, other things like that. And uh, when someone asks you, hey, what are you doing here? Or, hey, I've never seen you before. Just have your story and just say, hey, I'm, I'm so-and-so. Be an employee. It's okay. You work here. You're supposed to be here and that's fine, right? Um, so be prepared. You don't have to de-escalate a situation. Just make the situation normal, right? Um, and, you know, if you get into a question that you possibly don't have the answer to, right? Be like, I'm kind of new here. Right. I'm just, you know, I just started out. So. All right. So we get into the building. What about some post exploitation? Like what could we do while we're there? Right. So getting in the facility, right. We've shown some impact that we could get into it there. Maybe the badging technology is weak or whatever it may be, or they just let people or employees uh, tailgate in all day and nobody talks to you. Okay. So um, what are you going to do? Um, so defining your goals. And obviously, before we got there, we hopefully had a goal. We were either going to plant a device or we weren't. Maybe we were just going to see if we could. I've also been in facilities where they don't have an automatic lock for their workstation. So you can just come to a workstation and improve access, right? Um, so all of that. Um, it's better to call out um, critical issues in real time as opposed to post-mortem. So have that communication. Have a communication line with the POC. And if you do find something that's a critical, call it out, just like on any other kind of engagement, right? If this is a critical issue, you should be communicating in real time. We say that on all of our kickoff calls. If I find a critical vulnerability, I will communicate that in real time. If you don't, you should. And in this physical is no different. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes it makes sense to transition from an evasive engagement to a collaborative, right? Maybe the facility is... Uh, lock down a ton, or, you know, there's just not a good way for you to get in. Maybe you can get them to give you a badge and you go in and see what you could do if you had a badge, right? That's okay too. Like you don't, it's not necessarily claiming defeat, but they paid a bunch for you to be there. So be able to deliver or, um, you know, change that engagement to support the outcomes or that the, um, you know, the goals that they had, right? So be ready for that. Absolutely. All right. Um, Business impact, okay? So, right, let's talk about, um, you know, your goal intent, access uh, to people. Are they concerned about an active shooter? Like what, if those, if that's their thing, for example, uh, this good example of that, it'd be like a news organization, right? Um, and so the impactful evidence would be, you know, photographs inside the newsroom or photographs around the motor pool, whatever it may be, right? Showing that scenario that they're scared of how you were able to not necessarily perform that scenario, but you were able to be in the position of that uh, fear, right? Um, maybe they're worried about never compromise, uh, damage to skate equipment. Um, those are other kinds of goals as intent. And we want to capture the evidence to kind of prove that without actually doing the thing, right? 
Um, so maybe we do a drop device on the SCADA environment. Again, communicate, do they want that? Is that something they're comfortable with? Other things like that. Or just photographing in the SCADA environment. Be like, I have access to it, right? Uh, many times they say that, uh, you know, physical access is, you know, root on many devices, right? Um, you know, see if that's the truth. Um, or maybe their goal is just ransomware or other some kind of malware compromise when you're inside. So um, being able to illustrate that in your report is going to be, um, you know, very important to the customer who's paying you to be there, right? All right. Um, and then finally, exit, get out. It, it, you know, once you've accomplished, leave. You don't need to go find another area or what if we could get into this other room or maybe I could do this other thing, right? You've shown the impact that they were looking for. So leave and then get ready to write the report and communicate that with the client, right? Um, so very important. And don't go back in. Don't go back in. <laughs> Speaking of reporting. Right. Yeah, go ahead, yep. Travis. You want to talk this? Yeah, so now it's time to minutes. tell the story. It's yep. time to tell it in an effective way. You could go on site do all the coolest uh, mission impossible things uh, in the world that you could do. And then you get to the documentation phase and you didn't take any pictures. You didn't log any of your actions. And now you're just left with, I got in the building and it was a success. Um, that adds zero value. Um, chances are they're not going to come back next year. So uh, let's talk about some documentation tips. Uh, don't wait until after the engagement to start the report. So right when you start doing that remote reconnaissance, start building your graphs that go in your report. Um, build an aerial uh, representation, put entrances on it. The client's not gonna know what entrances you're referencing when you talk through a report. They might see the building differently. So have all these things labeled so that way when you walk through your attack scenario, they know what you're referencing is the same thing that, that they're thinking about in their mind. Have a method to, to log your actions. Uh, cell phones work great. Uh, at a minimum, uh, precise times of entry and exit should be con con collected. Um, sometimes you'll go into a building or sometimes you get a client where it says, hey, no, no photographs inside, period, end of story. That's okay. You can still illustrate impact. You can get that, that, that timestamp um, as you're walking up and as you're walking out um, of the facility and still have a good story to tell after the fact. Um, Log where you when and where you were for recon. Um, you could put that in the, the report uh, from a, a standpoint of here's where we actually sat because there was no cameras looking at us. Maybe you should put a camera on this side of the parking garage to see if somebody's doing something uh, shady. If you are using your, your cell phone for, for your, your, your method of, um, of logging, dim the screen. If you're out walking around trying to take pictures of people's badge, last thing you want to do is have your shutter noise on. Um, and have your notifications going out and your screen fully bright uh, or maybe your flash turned on. So make sure your camera is situated in a way that you're not looking like a creeper uh, walking into a Starbucks. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Next one. Yeah. You go, you always have two parts of the report. Um, anyone that's done penetration testing for any amount of time understands that you have the executive summary where you're talking to the big boss. And then you've got the technical analysis where you're talking to the guys that are most likely responsible for, for making uh, those, those, those hardening uh, steps. So in your executive summary, be clear and to the point. We assessed, uh, we assessed XYZ facility during this time frame. Access was granted through the use of XYZ method. Access was possible due to XYZ security gap. We were or were not confronted by employees or security during the time we were in there. We recommend the following steps to remediation. That's it. That's all you need in your executive summary to, to illustrate that impact um, to, to the executives. Uh, maybe you could put, if there was post-exploitation, we were able to do X, Y, Z while inside the facility before we left. Um, go ahead. Yep. Your technical analysis. So this is where we get back to being clear and to the point and having those detailed logs. Uh, create a map. We talked about creating the map. Have those egress points numbered on the map. Place uh, place of uh, uh, cameras where those were located. Put the compass direction on there. If you want to say we went in the north side entrance, put a compass on there that illustrates what north is. Not everyone's going to be able to understand that at first glance at their facility, or maybe they don't even care. Um, put other areas on that that map that may be relevant to your scenario. Maybe smoking areas. Did you use a smoking area to close a, clone a badge? 
highlight that. Um, maybe you did badge cloning down the street at the Starbucks. Maybe have a, a picture of where that was and the correlation of, of how you determine that that would be a good place to sit up uh, and, and do that badge clone. Um, without going into exhaustive levels of detail, discuss the actions in a way that allows a client to reference it on, on their surveillance footage. Maybe they're like, oh man, we had no clue these guys went in. Our piggyback controls didn't work. Nothing worked. Uh, so, so put it in there in a clear way that they can reference it. Uh, for example, on September 15th, uh, 2023 at 11 or at, at 1.33 Eastern, uh, we entered the facility through door number two uh, using um, a, a clone badge. And then after planning the, the drop device in room 103, um, XYZ departed the facility through door E1 at 1.55 Eastern, ending on-site actions. There's very little uh, up for interpretation at that point. They should be able to go back to badge logs, see what badge you used. They should be able to go back and forth between different uh, cameras to see how you got there, what you were doing. Um, very little up for interpretation. Go ahead. Yep. Getting close here. We'll, yep. we'll get through this. So uh, defendable timeline. Um, make sure you have your defendable timeline. It'll prevent that, that he said, she said, uh, stuff. So if, you, if you're using your, your cameras to do your logging, that all has metadata in it. So instead of maybe you get to a courtroom um, where they're accusing you of doing one thing, entering through one building, you can have metadata saying, oh no, here's where this picture was taken at this exact time um, to, to, to alleviate that. Uh, ensure that you're remaining within the confines of your authorization letter. Um, that, that goes hand in hand with that defendable timeline. You can't defend your actions if you were doing the wrong actions. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. So this gets into the last piece. So we've talked uh, a lot about how to perform this physical security assessment. Okay. And what, um, you know, kind of what's involved and stuff like that, but it's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to do it. Okay. To actually walk down these lanes. Right. Um, it's another thing to get slides or have this information. Um, and so what me and Travis actually started about two years ago working on this and then COVID hit was actually building a physical training class to actually break into a building, okay? And so what we have built is a three-day training class to take you through the actual process of performing a physical uh, assessment from, from the assessment or from scoping all the way to the report, right? And not only that, but we're going to do the remote reconnaissance, and you're going to go out and do that on a real facility, not just a fake example. Um, we're going to do talk about surreptitious entry tactics, and we're going to work on those when we actually do a real facility. We're going to have actual, um, uh, what do you call it, actors or um, you know people that are part of the script to clone a badge out in the real world, right? Maybe a Starbucks, maybe whatever. Um, and we're going to practice badge cloning as it would actually be performed, okay? And then um, we're also talk about post-exploitation, and we're going to do a, a CapEx where we do a live physical um, uh, training assessment. So we're going to take all that information as we've been going through it. Uh, you're going to learn it. You're going to go out and do it for a little bit, come back, talk about it, put that into a report, and then eventually we'll do a physical break-in where we'll actually go to a building that we, uh, a, co a real company that has authorized us to do this for training. And you will get to do that exact experience, right? Well, you will go in and break into the building using the techniques, and then you will come back and we'll write about it, right? And we're going to write about that, um, that uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, assessment, okay? Um, no one else that I know of is doing anything like this. And it's something that um, me and Travis have really wanted to do for a long time. Um, yeah, uh, we're, yeah. Anything we're, else, Travis? No, yeah, we're, we're super excited about it. Um, we've done mock ones of these in the past, and I, I don't think you'll get any better training value out of it. Yeah. It'll be very minimal time sitting behind a PowerPoint slide. It will be uh, day and night work uh, throughout the course. Uh, you'll get little warning orders to send you off somewhere to do some type of task uh, for whatever it was that you learned that day out in the real world. Um, the goal and an intent is to take someone that's never done a physical assessment before in their life and get them to where they can do day one when they get back to their 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 firm or their company 
start doing physical assessments. Go, go ahead and hit the next slide, Ralph. Yeah. Yeah. There was two other things. Yeah. Yeah. So along with that training, um, we've got tooling available. We've done all the hard work for you. Uh, we've put together all the tools. These will be available during the course for you to use at no charge. But if you do want to step away at the end of the, the, the training and have an already ready to go toolkit that has everything that you need without any of the fluff, any of the gimmicks, um, that, that'll be there available for you to purchase as well. And then one more click. If you want to learn more about our shenanigans, go look at prompt. There's the link there. Um, and you can, you can see one of our actual physical engagements that, that we've done uh, many years ago, uh, which is still a great story that we love to tell uh, in person. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for having us on. Yeah. Um, I know we're right at the time. Um, yeah. I, you go ahead, Jason. Do you guys have uh, like a few more minutes? We'll do some post-show banter. Yeah. With Q &A. yeah. Yeah. We can do, we can do questions too. Um, I, okay. don't, I don't think I have a, uh, I hate to use the word hard stop. Is that, is that, I don't yeah, yeah, yeah. Hard stop. Yeah. that's, it's corporate lingo. It's corporate All right, lingo. everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for this Black Hills Information Security webcast. If you ever need a pen test red team, thread hunt, anti-sock, anti -sock, anti -sock, yeah. uh, you know where to find us. Thank you for joining us for this Black Hills InfoSec webcast. Uh, we do these every week. We have one coming up next week, one the week after, one the week after. Uh, we take the things that we learn and then we teach you because the better you are defending, the harder it is for us to do what we do. Mm -hmm. And we want it to be as difficult as possible. Okay, I put the uh, the PDF of the comic actually in the Zoom chat. So if anyone wants to download, they can download the comic that way. So got that. Also, Travis, great to actually meet the person who's yeah. in the comic <laughs> yeah. here today. Uh, we're going to do some Q&A. So if you have questions, if you want to stick around and ask whatever questions you have, uh, feel free to do so. I have the first question that I saw in here was... I was like, I have a first question. But okay. it was just oh, question. oh, it's a, it's a battle. Well, Ralph, was that your first physical assessment ever was with Travis? Yes, that right. was my first physical assessment ever with Travis. And ask him how he knows about not wearing shorts. That was in the, <laughs> uh, you guys can read about it, right? Uh, so Travis had already done a bunch. In fact, he had already had like a nickname Hollywood because I guess he had done a bunch in uh, like Hollywood studios and other stuff like that. Anywho, um, so I was like, oh, I want to do physicals. And that was the wildest one I think I was ever on, even though all of them have their own little flavor. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Awesome. Thanks, uh, dude. All right. Good, continue. Yeah, I'm going to ask you uh, stop sharing your screen so that yeah, way yeah, yeah. we'll go up full size again. If I can figure out how to do that. Here we go. All right. So the question I saw was, how do you take notes during the assessment? Are you like actually taking notes in your phone? Are you doing a recording or are you like, how are you taking notes? Yeah. So on site in the heat of the moment, you're taking mental notes. Um, what I like to do when I'm in, in a facility, like if something critical happens, I'll just set my phone in a way where I can do the, uh, oh, here it is, just click it, the, the, the two buttons to make it take a, a picture. And that's a mental note of, hey, I was here. Uh, what action was I performing during that that time? But when you're doing your remote recon, your your distant recon on site, have your pen and paper ready. Um, have voice dictation, something going that you can capture those notes and 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 fall back on them when you get back to your hotel room and start developing developing your plan. Um, yeah, it's it's very fluid. So when you get back to your hotel room, you should be putting that stuff in the report, right? Like, don't you don't want to do. You do not want to do a three-day engagement. And then when you get back to your house, start writing the report, right? As with any engagement, you want to report as you go. And especially with this, getting that information in there is going to be help you a ton to actually uh, build this report. So. Uh, someone is clearing out all the questions. Ian, do you have one? Yes. The, what we've been doing since you've been on is to make sure that people know that their question's been captured. We've been capturing them. In another spot and letting them know that it'll be in mm. q a so yeah i've got all the questions oh. over here oh. that's oh, why when you said can you help me with questions at the end i was like absolutely and that's all right yeah like, they weren't they weren't questions they were um many of them are they, statements yeah yeah yeah, yeah. people mm -hmm. end up using the q a often like chat so yeah we've got a ton of questions here uh the first one is there was some confusion at the top and so many people asked this that i'm not even going to call out a name but you referred to bolo and da and da has I always know it as domain admin, but yeah. then some other people threw in some other maybe more military physical pen testing terms. So in your context, what is DA and what is BOLO? So I, I got a funny story for BOLO, um, <laughs> story, and that's why that, 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 that photo was in there. So BOLO, be on the lookout. Um, 
So essentially we did a physical pen a number of years ago for an organization. And in the process, the client didn't keep to himself the actions that were going to be taken. And what he did is went and informed his third party security service that, hey, there's going to be a physical pen test. Uh, these are the guys that are going to be doing the physical pen test. Here's the authorization letter of when they're going to be there. And that third party uh, organization that was doing their, their security was worried about their contract. If we were successful, maybe they'd pull that contract. So that third party uh, security company went and did research of their own. So they hunted my photo down on LinkedIn and they printed it off and they said, hey, be on the lookout for this person. Uh, he's been seen breaking into other similar organizations in the area and they put it inside of a drawer. Uh, inside of a security drawer. All the security guards had it. Oh, that's so, what you said about drawer. Yeah, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So we um, get in. Um, we didn't know this had happened. So we did a surreptitious entry on this facility. We figured that was the best way to go in because there's security guards. And lo and behold, we lockpick the security guard drawer to see if there's any badges that can get us further into the facility. I pull out the drawer and there's my photo inside of it. And I shut it real quick. I was like, whoa, this, this isn't real. I opened it up again and sure as sure <laughs> it was the bolo. So we had to have the conversation with the client of, hey, we're in, but we just want to let you know that the integrity of the engagement moving forward might be compromised because your, your third party security yeah. company did this. And then DA merely references uh, domain admin. So yeah. as, uh, as uh, penetration testers, oftentimes we get narrowly focused on getting DA as a success metrics. Um, that's not always the goal. In some cases, in news organizations, maybe they're worried about someone getting close enough to harm their on-air talent. So understanding that the client's intent behind the engagement drives those goals, drives those actions, and, and kind of creates the engagement in a way that is mutually uh, accessible or, or agreed upon between both organizations uh, as impactful to them. Long-winded answer. Sorry. No, I mean, it is the answer. Uh, <laughs> so uh, there's a ton of questions here. So I just want to let everybody know we're not going to be able to get to all your questions. We're gonna, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to cherry pick out the ones that maybe uh, people were a little, uh, a lot of people had. So one of the questions here, uh, a lot of them had to do with specific types of technologies. So I don't know that we're going to get into those, but the one that popped out at me was uh, J, uh, JG was asking about guard dogs. And how do you address guard dogs and other things? Uh, does that come out in the rules of engagement? How do you address that? I never have seen a guard dog on any engagement, right? Okay. Like I've never seen one. Now, now that doesn't mean, but I would definitely want to know, I guess, if they had a dog, you know, but yeah, I, I don't know, Travis, you got anything else to that? I've just never seen it. Steak or bullet? I don't know. <laughs> No, there's, there's a, <laughs> the shock value answer. Don't definitely don't do that. Please send um, complaints yeah, so to complaints at optive.com. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. Um, no, I, I think that's kind of an interesting one because yeah. I just don't think any organization would want to have a dog as security. So <laughs> what I would say to that is that is something that should be known up front. So as you're doing that, that that scoping, that initial call with your, your client, you're asking them things like, hey, is there security? on site what type of security is on site and hopefully that'll come up as hey that's one of the things that are there well maybe we choose another way into the facility or maybe we put some type of control in place to ensure that um, one no one gets bit um, and two the dog doesn't end up getting put down as a, as a result of uh, having a bite uh, due to an engagement so yeah we um, don't want to get safety is, safety is always number one yeah uh, safety for you and for Anyone involved at that facility is the number one priority when you're doing these physical engagements. So there was a lot of questions and a lot of discussion in both Discord and in the Q&A around the idea of getting caught. And I'm not going to call out all the folks that mentioned it, but if you asked the question or had the feedback on getting caught, what are your feelings on escalating kind of the ridiculousness of what you do? until you get caught so that you have something to go back and say you did right. I know Jason Street takes this approach in his engagements, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the right approach. What are your feelings on it? it to understand, so you're saying escalate actions to intentionally? So, yeah, they yeah, come so up to you and they're like, hey, 
Yeah, you, we caught you. And we, are, we think you're not supposed to be here, right? They don't necessarily know who you are yet, right? So getting caught organically, it depends on the operator, right? So if you're there, you, you're a seasoned physical guy, maybe you'll talk your way out of it. Maybe you'll have something prepared to try to get out of an escalation to see how far maybe I can social engineer the guard and go in further. Now, going back to intentionally getting caught, never. Why, why would you intentionally trigger alarms, trigger alerts, unless that was the primary and only intent of the engagement. Um, only thing you're gonna do is maybe you've got a security guard that, got, that has some PTSD and someone just busted into his building and now he's in a position where maybe he has to draw a firearm. That puts him in a compromising situation. It puts you in a compromising situation. It creates a legal debacle for everyone. And at the end of it, nobody wins. So intentionally triggering alarms to see how far you can escalate something bad call every single time every the, single time the other thing too i'll follow along with that is that if you do get caught please do not make your scenario i'm a pen tester doing a security assessment uh let me go okay to keep going on it seems like a fun game except for then you've just put yourself in a scenario where they don't believe anything you say at that point Right. Mm -hmm. or you make a fake authorization letter that says you're there to just do whatever. Um, so be really cognizant of that as like a way to get out of the scenario, because you could end up in a scenario where when they actually find out that that wasn't that there, no one's supposed to be doing this there, they're going to keep going, at, you know, further down the rabbit hole. And then they're not going to believe anything you say. And then maybe police are getting involved and you don't really want the police to get involved in any. Yeah. Way. Last thing you want is a rent -a cop who's not properly trained or yep. is a little bit concerned about their job and shanky shaky holding a yep. gun because they think something is, is something yeah something bad is really going to happen especially They're in the day where we have so many active shooter incidents yep intentionally triggering is is is, is a bad bad call i mean yep. other organizations other people might see it differently i mean do what do what your 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 paycheck can handle i guess yeah for, for well, what it's worth but go ahead I was just saying, frankly, um, in my experience, and, and I haven't done a, a ton of physical assessments, but I have done quite a few. I have never encountered a company that has armed guards. Okay. Oh, they're there. They're there. <laughs> yeah. They, no, they and I'm not yeah. discounting that they are. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm just saying that personally, and in in if there are, we've always been like, no, sorry, we're not going right. to test them. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's an approach we hear from a lot of organizations. And for what it's worth, since, since I did mention Jason Street, he does go into a lot of that as well about uh, safety and, and what to do there. Often it's when he's in the lobby of a bank or something like that, he just kind of keeps upping the ante of, you know, now I'm on the computer, now I'm on this until someone pays attention to him. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's kind of where it's going, but yeah, never alarms or anything like that. Um, I, I want to focus. I mean, if that's, if that's the intent of the engagement, then absolutely go for it. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I want to, I'm, I'm going to consolidate a bunch of questions because we'll maybe go for a couple more minutes. And then uh, the rest of you who didn't get your questions answered because there was a mountain, will you two gentlemen be able to jump into Discord in the live chat and, and maybe touch base with some of these folks who didn't get a chance to get their question answered? Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So I'm going to consolidate. Yes. There was a ton of questions that I saw both in Discord and in the Q&A chat about the list of tools that is was, in that tooling training kit that's you yeah. literally jumped i, I okay, said i'm gonna cool. i'm gonna consolidate these down into tools and environments because yeah. <laughs> we had a we had a bunch of questions from like tom bombadil who said would you say the on-site kit deviant uses is industry standard I, I don't know if you two have seen kind of his videos on the kit that he brings we had mm -hmm. another one from mark seiden who asked about the flipper zero uh, you know what do you think about that sure. using that in engagements um and uh the rest were yeah just around kind of the, the tools what kind of tools are you bringing I, I i'll i'll take the first stab and travis can follow me up and do it whatever you got i think it's funny because like the kit right um some of this stuff you need but you don't want to get too much right like you don't like you all this stuff uh, sometimes it only has like very very small edge cases right so um specifically on the kind of the kit we put together which i have not seen uh, the uh, the uh, uh, Deviance Toolkit, right? Like I haven't actually like looked at it, but the kit that we we actually are just using the stuff that 
we had to use every time, right? The stuff the most important for success on the engagement. Um, but we will, to answer your question, um, have a list of all the stuff in there. Some of that is custom, like uh, some of the stuff that Travis has put together is kind of custom. Some of this stuff is kind of hard to come by because you can possibly order it, but some of it you have to order directly from manufacturers and stuff like that. Um, and other stuff is very easy to come by, right? It's, you know, very commodity, like a can of air or whatever it may be, right? Um, yeah. So, but we pretty much have doled it down to the most important stuff inside of that kit. And we will have a list of those things. So you could technically build the kit yourself, but what we're trying to do is bring it all in one. That's something that's turnkey that you don't have to individually uh, kind of put together. Remember we talked about building a 3D printer versus just buying one. Yes. Um, maybe you yeah. just want to buy one, right? Yeah. It takes a long time to resource all the nuanced parts. It does. It does. The other one I meant to ask about, but I, I'm asking more because I'm like, can I justify another silly purchase to my spouse? Uh, is is uh, quadcopters and drones? Oh, Ooh. Travis, Travis, is, you take that one because he's got actually a yeah. license to fly legit. Yeah. So, well, I'll, I'll touch back on the. Uh, I think someone asked about the Flipper Zero. Um, yeah, it's absolutely a valid tool. Um, I wouldn't use it to go and clone somebody's badge. Maybe if I was in a, a security guard desk and I see a badge sitting there, I want to get a quick read. That's a great use case for that, that I can write to another badge later. Um, only thing I really would use it for is if I get a badge read, I clone that badge data, say using my Proxmark 3, um, maybe use that flipper as a quick attestation of, hey, yeah, this card number copied over correctly, we're good to go. Um, but on a, on a real physical pen test, I haven't seen, seen, seen where it's been overly useful um but it doesn't mean it's not a, a great tool to have yeah that's um, a great tool. yeah yes. uh, drones drones oh uh, yeah doctors. so we've used drones in the past drones can get you in trouble really quick uh first of all you got to be licensed you have to be skilled um anyone sees a drone hovering over their building mm -hmm. um, they're probably going to call it out but there are use cases where they can be useful beneficial um i would say go back to the engagement uh, what was the original intent behind the engagement? What are the actions you're willing to take without getting compromised to make this successful for uh, the client? And if it makes sense for you to use a drone on one situation, use it. Doesn't mean you need to bring a drone everywhere you go. Um, having all the, all, being the tactical guy with the trunk full of, full of crap <laughs> is not yeah. ideal. Coming having from the, the military, being tactical, right? Yeah, it, it really yeah. has its baggage. Um, yeah. you know. It's a lot of maintenance. It's, you don't want to have to charge those batteries every time you yeah. you go somewhere. Yeah, I, I will add one thing that when I would do both physical engagements and also controls validation, I would use my professional tools like my Proxmark or things like that to actually do the work. But then often when I would do the report, I would say, oh, and by the way, these very easy commercially accessible tools also work. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's kind of the demo for the executives where they're like, well, that looks like a bunch of wires and wizardry. Yeah. And it's like, you know, you can go buy this for like a hundred bucks and it's got a dolphin sure. that you talk to. Um, <laughs> so, right. Uh, let's talk about environments and then we'll end on one question. So several anonymous attendees talked about, have you ever, well, let's break this up. One asked a question that I loved because I've actually been a part of some of this. Uh, have you ever had to steal a safe? Oh, no. so, <laughs> go ahead uh, from my parents when i ran away yes no um never so i have a this is this is my view on 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 stealing stuff if you're going in to do an assessment for a client uh and there's potential for legal issues the last thing you want to do is remove an item from their property, be it someone's personal property or uh, something owned by the corporation, you're taking it out of there. Now, if a client said, hey, can you get into the bank vault and steal this mock safe that we set up? Yeah, absolutely. We, we would absolutely go for it. I can't say that I've have ever had that request, uh, but but typically pulling stuff out of a, a facility is um, not, not a great, great idea unless you're there to do that specific thing, in which case I would make sure it's not a production thing. Um, it would be something that was set there intentionally to see if it could be done. Also, from a technical standpoint, safe cracking and safe uh, access is a whole different uh, skill set, right? And so that's like its own thing. And there's whole schools about that for very specific kinds of people. But anyways, um, you know, it's something we're probably not going to um, say that we're going to do so great at. 
So, right. I can yeah. say that I have gone down the rabbit hole of learning how to uh, pickpocket. Um, oh, nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is super helpful. With the, with the sole intention of being able to remove someone's badge, badge uh, yeah. from their person. Yep. Um, and that's a fun adventure. If you want to talk about getting real creepy. Um, that's, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the, it could also so, get you punched yeah. in the face. Yeah. Let, let's go ahead and bundle up some questions because a lot of them had to do with environments. So uh, one, one person, I'm trying to find their name, but the question was, how do you approach uh facilities that are there is an, it's anonymous that's why I can what are some strategies for gowned or clean room environments pharma clean manufacturing and semiconductor i think generally that's a, a true specialist or the risk is too high but what is your opinion mm, yeah I, I would say the yeah, risk I think is the, high. the laws are going to shut that one down um yeah. before you actually get to it so that would that'd be going back in and doing your environmental reconnaissance so looking up uh um, the ones that we referenced specifically for for medical um, in the presentation. See what first what you're able to do, so that way you don't go back to the client and say, "No, I don't want to do it because um, it makes me feel uncomfortable," or "We can't find somebody to do it." I mean, that, that's a valid choice, but at the same time, if there are controls that can be put in place, maybe it's an opportunity for you to to upsell that and and, and learn a new learn a new skill um, or or do something special for for a client that otherwise uh, someone else hasn't been able to do. Uh, but I think. Yeah particular in, in, into getting into like a medical lab or something like that, that chances are there's enough controls in place to prevent that from happening. And if they wanted to test it, uh, it's probably better for them to have someone that's certified to walk in that building in the first place to see if it's possible. So number one is safety on these engagements. Number two is business impact. We don't want to cause any impact to that uh, company and how they make money. So safety and then are we going to cause them to lose money or downtime or other things like that? That goes with kind of anything like that, especially for physical, you know, so yeah. And I think that might be one of those scenarios where we don't want to cause downtime um, to affect the business. Yeah. So last question, and it does relate to those things as well, because several people brought up and even Ashley had mentioned like armed guards and yes, like skiffs or uh yeah you know, dod contractors or things like that that do actually have like a g license or things like mm -hmm. that, that those yep. exist what sure. is the approach for pen testers like you where you're hired by a company that has that and there's those kind of real risks of there is an armed guard there and i'm trying to get around them someone is surveillance um so that goes back to doing your, your intelligence right so uh you got armed guards we're automatically going to bring two people on site that's it's a requirement so one person is doing actions the other person is watching that armed guard, see where they're at. And chances are there's more than one, one door on a facility. You can go in. If you did all your reconnaissance properly, you're only at that site for 15, 17 minutes tops. You're in, you're out, you're done. It's over um, if you did everything right. So uh, things can go south. Um, if it's and law enforcement and it's definitely going to be a hairy situation, Maybe you call the 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 law the, the the local sheriff, the local police department, talk to the watch commander and say, hey, we were brought on by these people to do this this assessment. If you get a weird call between these hours, call us. Call this point of contact that works at that facility, or they can contact the armed sheriff. Chances are the armed sheriff is going to let you do whatever it is that you were hired to do without divulging that to the other security that's on site. Yeah, with government stuff too, especially with any classified information, other stuff like that, like we're just going to say no, like that, those are scenarios that we don't really have the capability, it's not just capability, we don't have the permission, right, they don't have like no one can actually write in like read you on to these things or you know you that's a whole like we have a process for this so um you know don't sell it as hey you know we're going to let you do this no you're no you you we we're not going to get involved in that. So. Rest assured, the government has their own people. That, yep, you know, right. Absolutely. Yeah. Dedicated. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. All right. So one, thank you for taking the extra 20 some minutes to answer some of these questions. For those who did not get their question answered, we apologize. We went 20 minutes long. There's a lot of great questions <laughs> in here. Uh, Travis and Ralph will be around in the BHIS Discord under the webcast live chat channel. So if your question didn't get answered, please restate it in there. And uh, in case you don't know who they are on Discord, what are your Discord IDs so that people can tag you to ask these questions? Mine is Ralph T E Tango Echo. Okay. I have no clue. I think it's T Weathers <laughs> or T Weathers Sec. Uh, yeah. I set up Discord. Admittedly, I am not big on the socials. I will be in there and I'll I'll I'll, I'll post something so somebody can tag me. Oh, so yes, Travis, wonderful. So and uh, one last it thing. T Weathers. T Weathers. Weathers. 
Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Ashley. And quick reminder for everyone, your training class, when is it coming up and how can they register? Yeah. So the training class is actually going to come up in November. And um, so it'll be a couple months away and they can register on Anti-Siphon. Um, the link was posted out there and I will post it again. Uh, we also have um, a little website. I'm posting it right now, physicalexploit.com, where we're going to have any other information, resources, and other stuff like that. So Wonderful. So yeah, definitely. If you if you liked this and you want to hear from the experts and learn a little bit more from their expertise and their experience, definitely check it out. So Travis, Ralph, thank you so much for you know going through and sharing your stories and helping people. We've got 361 of you that stuck around. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, so please, uh, if you're not over in the Discord, definitely join us over in Discord, discord.gg forward slash BHIS. We'll be in the webcast and live stream channel. And for myself, Ryan, Ashley, Deb and Jason, who had to drop off, uh, BB, and uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting others uh, that joined for uh, Chris Trainer, uh, who joined for pre show banter. Thank you for joining us for another BHIS webcast. We do this every Thursday. So come check us out. We also do anti siphon anti casts on Wednesday. You should check those out as well because there's a lot of really good information. Don't forget Wild West Hacking Fest coming up. Uh, I think we're closed for on site, but if you still want to be virtual or you want to take training, you can still get in. So go check that out at Wild West Hack and fest.com oh, that's enough of the salesy businessy stuff don't you think i think ryan kill it with fire kill it with fire <laughs> bye 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 guys all right thank you <laughs>